everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. My name is Todd Rothman, and in this video, we're going to go over what's known as rearrangement. Now, rearrangement is something that we're going to use throughout the whole year. Okay, so this is a, a very, very important topic that you must master because you're going to see it over and over, and you're never going to have the time to think about it the way we are now. You're always just going to be expected to know how it works. Okay, so we're going to break it out very carefully right now. Now, there are three, there's actually four types of rearrangement, but we're going to learn three in theory. And then there's a problem that I'm going to do that's going to introduce you to the last type. But I, I want to try to challenge you to figure it out before I teach it to you. Okay, so let's get started with the first type of rearrangement. Now, a rearrangement occurs, whoops, a rearrangement takes place when you have a carbocation. Okay, it doesn't matter how you got to the carbocation, and that's why this is something that we learned throughout the whole year, because there are many carbocations and many different reactions. But any time you have a, a carbocation, you always have the potential for rearrangement. So here's how it works. Let's say we have a reaction, and somehow it, we get a carbocation here, like that, and it doesn't matter how we got here. So I'm gonna draw an arrow that says we got to this carbocation. It does not matter how we got to this carbocation, okay? The key is we're here. So in our case, it could be a BR leaving or an OH that gets protonated and then it leaves. It doesn't matter. But here we are, we're at a carbocation. Now, notice that the carbon that's positive is secondary. The rule is, here's the golden rule. If the neighbor Actually, you know what? I'm going to use language that you guys now know. If the beta carbon is a higher degree, then rearrangement can occur. So the idea about this is that when you have a, a carbocation, if the neighbor is a higher degree, then the positive carbon would prefer to be there. So the shift of the, there's going to be a shift that takes place that allows for the positive to change its location. So right now, as it stands, this is a primary neighbor. And this is a secondary neighbor on the left, but we don't want that. We want to make it a higher degree. So I'm going to go like that. Now, notice that this is a tertiary neighbor. So we have a tertiary neighbor and we have a primary neighbor. The carbon that's positive right now is secondary. So we would prefer to make the positive carbon tertiary. Because remember, tertiary carbons are more stable than secondary, right? So for that reason, we're going to do what's known as a hydride shift. Now here's how it works. If the carbon that's higher degree, in this case tertiary, if it has an H, then we're going to shift the H over to the carbon that's positive. Here's how it works. The carbon that has the H that's higher degree, that H is going to take the electrons away from carbon. This is something that normally wouldn't happen because carbon is more electronegative, but this is an exception because the system as a whole becomes more stable if it allows H to leave with its electrons. See that? So watch. This H is going to take the electrons away from carbon. So I'm going to take this bond here. I'm going to make it jump over to the secondary carbocation. It leans over and bonds there. So because it's neighbors, it just folds over and boom, it goes over. And watch what happens. So now all of a sudden, the carbon that was positive, the secondary carbon, it now has an H attached to it. You don't have to show the H, but I want you to visualize it. Now, remember, the H took its electrons and it shifted. It didn't just go as a proton. This is called a hydride, a hydride shift. Now, H plus is known as a proton. H minus is known as a hydride. Okay, that's the difference. We're having an H minus. H takes the electrons and it jumps over. Now, the carbon that lost its proton, or its, I'm sorry, its hydride, is now positive. Notice that? Now it's positive because it lost its electron. That hydrogen left with it. So it's now positive. That's called a hydride shift. And this always happens whenever the neighbors are a higher degree than the carbocation. 
that you're first with, that you're stuck with to begin, okay? So that's called a hydride shift. Now, there are other reasons to go through hydride shifts. Imagine if we had a carbocation that looked like this, where this is positive, and let's say over here, we have an OCH3. Now, you might say to yourself, and let me actually make it more clear by going like that first. So here's my situation. And the question is, do I have a shift? And why, if we do, would we have that shift? Well, I could tell you now, the reason why we have a shift up here is because we have a tertiary carbocation, which makes it more stable because of hyperconjugation, right? And also because of increase in inductivity. So those are the reasons why the top one would even shift from a secondary cation and go over to the uh, tertiary carbocation. Now, in this case, we have a secondary carbocation, and this is primary, and the neighbor on the left is secondary. So the neighbor on the left doesn't seem to make sense to do a shift, but it does, because this oxygen has lone pair. And so if we were to get the carbon that's next to the carbocation positive that holds the oxygen, then we would have resonance to stabilize. So this actually does go through a shift. This is kind of like, not an exception, but it's different than this first rule. The first rule says anytime you have a higher degree, you shift. That's easy. But this one, it's the same degree, and yet you still shift because, like I said, by doing the hydride shift, there's an H here, by doing this shift over to here, we now have a carbocation that's positive and it has an O attached to it. Any atom with a lone pair would allow this to happen. So let me write that down here as a rule. Any atom with a lone pair can help the cation by resonance. This is very important because this allows us to do a shift in a way that normally wouldn't happen, and that is to go from the same degree shift, okay? Or even lower degree would do it. And initially, that's what I was going towards, but we'll wait. Now, why? Because right now, this here has resonance stabilization. So we've now benefited by having resonance. And I have to tell you, in organic chemistry, resonance is one of the best things that you could have for a system. It's better than hyperconjugation. It's better than inductivity because you really are moving electrons over a larger area. So this is definitely going to go through a shift. Okay, we were going to have a hydrate shift here. Okay, so that's the idea. This is called an H shift. Usually over the arrow, you write something like that. Now, all rearrangements require temperature. So when you see shifts, they usually have temperature going along with it. And the reason why is because in order to make that shift, you do have to apply a little bit of energy. So th there's usually a temperature uh, um, identified with the rearrangement, but it doesn't have to be for our purposes. But usually there is. And you'll, so if you see temperature, that's why it's there. It's there to, to allow the shift to occur. All right, so this is known as a hydride shift. Now let's continue with this logic. Let's go over to another example. And now in this example, we're going to talk about what's known as a methyl shift, methyl shift. So a methyl shift is, let's say we get to a carbocation, right? So here's a carbocation. And now I want you to consider that this is secondary, this is primary, this is quaternary. Now here's the thing. Notice that there's a higher degree next door. So we definitely want to do a shift. We don't want a secondary carbocation if we have a higher degree next door. If it's further away, no shift. It has to be right next door, okay? But this is a quaternary carbon. That means that it has no H's. So if there's no H's, if no H, then methyl shift. We shift the next smallest group. See, here's the logic. An H is very small. Its bond is easy to break, and it's because of how small it is, it's easy, it's energetically favored to do that. But if there is no H, methyl's next up. A methyl is easy to shift because it doesn't require as much energy as a bigger group. So that's why we do a methyl shift. So for example...